All right. So we're starting a new series today. What does God want? What does God want? All right. So I want to give you just a second because I'm going to start with about a moment of 10 second silence. And I want you to come up with an answer. What does your brain tell you at first? Don't, I don't want you to tell me. This is rhetorical. But you got 10 minutes of silence to answer that question. What does God want? Now, I'm sure you had a chance to solve God's problems with the world in that, minute of te- or that moment of 10 seconds. Uh, but I want, that to, I want you to be thinking about whatever answer you came up with, because a lot of times in our lives, when we think through that question, or maybe you've never even thought through that question, our lives oftentimes are filled with what do we want. We kind of mask it in what God wants, but it's usually more about what do we want? What do I want? What do I hope that God answers his, my prayer in my life? It's not really about, God, how can I serve you? It's more, God, how can you bless me in my needs? What's next? What's my next job? What's next for dinner? Hey, what are we having for lunch, honey? That's our brains. That's where our brains go. And none of that's bad, right? None of those things are bad. But is it really the answer to the question of what does God want? You see, if we genuinely asked ourselves that question, we cared about the answer that we gave ourselves, we need to follow it up with, well, how would it change us? How would it change our lives? How would it change what we do? How would it change our career? How would it change where we go to eat, who we eat with? How would it change the job you take? How would it change the way you spend your money? You see, if we have to have an answer for what does God want, then all these other things take the way, go by the wayside. They, they take uh, less priority in our lives. But if we don't have an answer for what does God want, then all those things that I just said, they take the precedence. They, they kind of push God off to the side. And it's a natural human drift. And so we just have to be aware of what this tension is that goes on in our lives. So this sermon series is all about the fundamentals in our faith, all right? This, this idea of what, what is it that makes us up as followers of Christ. Uh, Matt and I, we get to go down to uh, Haiti and the DR, and we share what's called the Cyprus movement curriculum, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but we, we also partner with them up here in America, and it's a pastoral training, and we go through and we do all this leadership development stuff for pastors. And so what we're doing is we're taking the content from some of that, and we're giving it to you. So in our training, we call what we're talking about today, these fundamentals, we talk about it as our DNA, all right? And your DNA, as you sit here this morning, you do not have to tell your DNA what to do. In fact, your DNA right now is telling you what to do. And if it weren't telling you what to do, you wouldn't literally be sitting here, all right? So your DNA is at work because that's what your DNA does. The same thing happens in our faith. We have a DNA that works within our lives, and it's our fundamentals of faith and what, what that looks like. Many, many in the church, they don't even know what their fundamentals are, or that they do, they've forgotten them, or at worst, maybe they've neglected them. But the reality is, is they're still there. I don't know how many of you have played different sports, but I've coached football, I've coached soccer, and I've coached volleyball all at the uh, varsity level. And one of the things that you have to go over in high school is you have to make sure the fundamentals are strong. Because if the fundamentals break down, it doesn't matter how talented that kid is, they're going to be out there on an island all by themselves, and the team is worthless. You're only as good as your fundamentals, and that's just the way it works. And that's the same way it works in our life, and our spiritual walk, is we have to know what these fundamentals are. And so as a follower of Christ, our focus has to be on what does God want. Our focus has to be on what does God want. As a follower of Christ, that needs to be first and foremost in every single thing that we say or do. So we're going to take you through three primary elements of what God wants over the next three weeks, all right? And the foundation that we're going to be talking about is the movement kingdom harvest, all right? The movement of God is what we're going to be covering today. Matt's going to talk about the kingdom next week, and the following week he'll talk about the harvest. All right, and so we're going to be talking about what are the fundamentals of our faith in each one of those areas. And you're going to be able to see, hopefully, if we do this right, you're going to be able to see how the answers that we give are are woven into every single thing that we do at Journey, all the way down to growth track, all the way to our mission statement that you see plastered all over everything. Everything is woven through this DNA. Our DNA is woven through everything that we've done as a church. So I want us to go to the Word of God here this morning because it would be pointless to talk about God if we don't go to His Word, right? All right, so let's see what God says He wants 
uh, starting in Habakkuk, all right? Habakkuk 2.14 says, For as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness of the glory of the Lord. So the glory of the Lord is as full in the earth as water is in the oceans, all right? Keep going. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord, of God. The sky proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour out their speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There's no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, he has pitched a tent for the sun. The, the earth and the sea are declaring the glory of God. The heavens and the earth everywhere is declaring the glory of God. So I want us to go to the New Testament and find out, okay, so what does that mean for us? Okay, the nature is crying out and glorifying God. What does, what does God expect out of us? Ephesians 1 says this, So we praise God for the glorious grace that he has given to us, that he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Jump to verse 12. God's purpose Hear me on this. What does God want? God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ, because he came to the Jews first, would bring praise and glory to God, right? Praise and glory, just like the earth, just like the seas. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own. By giving you the Holy Spirit. You have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, given you by our God and Savior, whom he promised long ago. And this Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance that he promised, that he purchased us to be his own people. Why did he do this? And he did this so that we would praise and glorify him. You see, this isn't a mystery. The answer to what does God want is not wrapped in some mysterious language throughout the scriptures. He makes his purpose in our lives very clear. He wants to be glorified. God wants the glory. God wants the glory. God is not about you. God wants the glory for himself. Now I realize, all right, one of the questions that you have to wrestle with, and if you don't know the answer to this one, you're going to have a really hard time talking about God. Well, if you've ever witnessed anybody, well, you serve a really selfish God that wants all the glory for himself. If you don't know how to answer that question, you're going to be really stuck on this one because God wants the glory. We are not down here to glorify ourselves. We are down here to glorify his name. And we have gotten our focus misaligned. Somehow or another, we think that this whole world is about us and we think that God should answer our prayers for our benefit. And the reality is our lives should be a reflection of the glory of God in all that we say and all that we do everywhere that we go. It's not about how he can make us look good while we're alive on this earth. And we we start focusing upon things like our career. We start focusing upon things like our health. Yeah, that's become a real topic of conversation lately. We start focusing upon retirement accounts. We start focusing upon our extracurricular activities. We start focusing upon which school our kids are going to go to and and which one's better. We start focusing upon which church are we going to go to that's more in line with what I want them to say. Hmm. We've lost sight of what God has allowed these options to even exist for in our lives. You see, there's nothing wrong with any of those things that I just said, but there's everything wrong with them if they come before God. Everything's wrong with them. You see, the whole point of us being down here is so that we can take all those things that I just said and bring glory and honor to God in his name. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter your job. It doesn't matter the size of your retirement account. It doesn't matter what sport your kids are a part of. It doesn't matter where you got your pedigree from in your, athletic, or in your academic schooling. None of that matters. It matters zero unless you use it for the glory of God. Now, when you use it for the glory of God, you can use who you are for amazing purposes. But we've got to get our focus right. So how are you, his church, going to bring glory and honor to his name? That's the question you got to ask yourself. Is how are you, how are you going to, not me, not your neighbor, not your brother, not your sister, not your mom, not your dad, but how has God uniquely gifted you to bring glory and honor to his name? That's what we have to be concerned about. And when, when we aren't concerned about that, we can go down some pretty bad paths, right? 
Let's look at what Jesus says about these things that kind of distract us at times, right? Again, they aren't bad things. They just can become bad. Look at Jesus. He says, so don't worry about these things, saying what you will eat or where you're going to go or what sickness you're going to get or what we will wear. Keep going. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. All the things I just talked about dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows you need them. He knows what you need. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So again, the things that we desire, they aren't bad. They're bad when they take the focus off of God. They're bad when they take precedence over what it is that God wants in our lives. So one of the taglines that we use when we're doing our training with the, the material that we use is God's glory is greater than our story, all right? So we're going to say this together because we're going to memorize it, right? His glory is greater than our story. All right, let's do it again. His glory is greater than our story. Do it one more time. His glory is greater than our story. That means you don't matter, foo. All right? <laughs> we don't matter. All right? And that might be depressing, but it's really not. It's freeing. We are nothing in comparison to the glory of God. My purpose on this earth is not to glorify my name or my family name or my legacy. My purpose on this earth is to create a legacy of God's glory. That is it. That's all I have to do. Wherever I go, it's really simple. Whatever I do, that's the purpose. All right? So God desires glory. That is as simple as it can possibly get. In our training, though, in this movement of God, when, when God is moving within his church, this, this idea of what is God doing, and, and we are living in such a, man, I, I get so frustrated sometimes listening to people. We are so hopeless right now. We're angry, and we're hopeless, and we're frustrated, and we're, and we're depressed, and we're full of despair and anxiety. And we, it is amazing to me that we think somehow or another that the, the world in America right now, God has somehow shocked at the, what's happening. He has not lost control, people. His hope is alive as long as it's been ever alive. The things that we're facing are nothing in comparison to the span of eternity. We have not lost hope. But man, Christians are walking around like we might as well ha hang it up. We might as well just give up because, man, God's coming back soon. I mean, look at Revelations. It's happening. We might as well hunker down, put ourselves in a bunker. By the patriot things, right? All right, no, that doesn't come across on your feeds? Okay, all right, so. All right, you know what comes across on my feeds? Okay, so. But we can't live hopeless. We can't live hopeless. We have the hope of God. And so when we do that, when we look at this movement of God, he is at work, my friends, across the world right now. He has not let go of anything. Now, maybe we have. So every believer, another th phrase that we use in this is every believer is a missionary. Every believer is a missionary. So you're going to say that one with me too. Every believer is a missionary. Every believer is a missionary. One more time. Every believer is a missionary. That means you. All right. Now, if you haven't called upon the name of Jesus Christ, if you haven't made him the Lord of your life, then you're, this one doesn't apply to you. All right. So you just listen to the rest of this message and I will give you all kinds of um, ammunition for why Christians are hypocrites, all right? So you, will, you can sit there and I will give you more uh, to throw at us, all right? But the reality is every believer is a missionary in God's kingdom. And we don't do this very well. Everywhere we go, the, the life that God has given us is to bring glory and honor to his name. Look at, look at the scriptures here. I want to go to uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Look at what... Paul is telling the church in Corinth, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. He's talking about the new man, the old man has gone, the old man suffering from sin and shame and condemnation and guilt, God put him aside and the new man has come, the new man of Christ, the new mind, we can be reconciled in our minds to Christ. Keep going. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us Every missionary, or every believer is a missionary. The ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself. 
He is reconciling the world to himself, not counting the people's sins against them. And yet we hold people's sins against them all the time. We do. It is, it is the flaw of humanity. And that's why we can't do this without God. But we hold ourselves captive to our own sins. We count our own sins against us. And he has released us from that. He says, this is the message of reconciliation. This is why we're, we are supposed to be reflecting the glory in this world that is full of darkness. Keep going. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. If, if you are the only Christian in your circle of life, don't go anywhere but the people you know, the, the circles that you live in, and you're the only Christian that you knew, would God be making a very big appeal through your life? That's how you answer this question. That's how you find out if God is truly, if you're really living for his glory or if you're living for your benefit. If your circle wouldn't be very influenced by God, then you're probably really not all that concerned about what God wants in your life. And I'm sorry to say that, but you just got to think through it like that, all right? So it's a little convicting, but it gets better. Hold on, just keep going, all right? So we have to ask ourselves, okay, so if that's really the case, what is it that Christ saved us from? What is this great, what is this great message of reconciliation? If God expects me to be a, a missionary everywhere I go, what kind of a message is he expecting me to take into all of my circles? Because God, you really don't understand kind of where I work, like... It'd be really awkward to tell them about Jesus. Like, whoo, all right? Yeah, he expects you to tell them about God. You're a missionary everywhere you go. Look at what he says here. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Oh, stop right there. Brothers and sisters, that is phenomenal information right there. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness, the prince of power, the prince of the air, the darkness that rules over the earth. He has rescued us out of the darkness, and it says that he has transferred us. The old has gone, and he has transferred us into the kingdom of his son. All right, we have to be excited about that. All right, I'm glad you are. That's really good. All right, so we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Do you realize the kingdom of God is still here? Like he is still king in his kingdom? He still has control. There is no dominion. There is no power. There is no authority. There is no angel. There is no demon that is higher than God's name. He has not won. God defeated him on the cross. If you study the scriptures, he walked the, he walked the loser naked through the streets. Satan lost. And we walk around like our heads are hung low, like somehow or another, we forgot. Because we forgot the fundamentals of what Jesus did. And man, we got to start acting like the church, because there's a lot of darkness out there right now. Keep going, I don't even know where I am. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for everything was created by him. The firstborn, this goes all the way back to the garden. Everything in the Garden of Eden, in the beginning, everything in Genesis was created by God, for God. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible, the invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all these things have been created through him and for him. Keep going. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. You and I are the church. Jesus Christ is the head of it. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. He is the first one that's ever been resurrected by his own power. He is the only one that's ever overcome death on his own. He is the firstborn of the dead. This is the good news that Christ has brought to us. Keep going. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. My friends, that is what God has given to us, this, this idea to be missionaries, to be reflections of this incredible glory of what God has come to do in our lives. But we have to ask ourselves, is this, is this ministry of reconciliation even a part of us? All right, keep going. Because he says this, once you were alienated, all right, he understands, yes, you did live in darkness. That's where you were transferred out of once you were alienated. And you're hostile in your minds. This, folks, this is where it's at. 
You were hostile in your minds to this idea of forgiveness and not holding people against it in your minds because of your evil actions. But he has now reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. He did this so that we could have this ministry of reconciliation, this alienation that we experience goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. All right? And Growth Track, all right? and, and you should have received some emails. Growth Track's coming up. If you haven't gotten an email, you should go to Growth Track. All right? So in Growth Track, we do everything around this. All right? Everything that we do is our DNA. All right? This is what we say in Growth Track. Jesus of the New Testament is the answer to the curse and the genesis of the Old Testament. Jesus of the New Testament is the answer to the genesis, the curse of the genesis in the Old Testament. And what we mean by that is in the point, and when we are in the Garden of Eden, all right, and you and I might as well be in the Garden of Eden every day, all right, we are tempted with sin. And we eat of the fruit every single time we are tempted to sin. And when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit the first time, they were kicked out of the garden. And if you remember, a flaming sword was put in the entrance and kept man out. Why? Because from that point forward, man and God could no longer walk together. God separated man from being in his presence. The first thing that we see that Adam and Eve experienced was shame and condemnation, right? It wasn't because they were naked. It's because they were sinful. All right? They realized that they were now exposed. Their, their, the, their heart motives were exposed. It's the same thing in our, in our walk with God. You, you watch the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is this constant story of repentance and defiance. Repent, defy, repent, defy. It's our lives. It's the epitome of when we sin, we sin, we repent, we beg God to forgive us, and we wait for him to slap us upside the head and condemn us to hell, right? He doesn't do that. I mean, sometimes he punishes us, but he's not going to send us to hell because he saved us. He saved us. You see, therein comes the good news because here we go back to Jesus Christ. Remember what happened when he died on the cross? There's this great big veil that separated God and his people from his presence. Do you remember that story? And at the point of his resurrection and the point of his death, that veil tore. That flaming sword that separated God and man in the garden was removed and now put inside of us. He's called the Holy Spirit. I wrote a book on it. Pick it up out in the lobby. Find out what this looks like in your life. The Holy Spirit is there for you to grow in your faith, to understand how you have been put back together with God. He has redeemed the broken relationship from the Garden of Eden and has put His Spirit at work inside of you. You can walk with God again. You can know His will in your life. You can hear His voice as Adam and Eve were walking in the garden. And we as Christians are living powerless in a dark world. Woo! That's God. And we've got to get back to it. That's the fundamentals. The Trinity. God the Father rules. Jesus Christ paved the way. The Holy Spirit lives in every one of us. And he will till we die. Because he was given to you as a guarantee to get your sorry butt to heaven. He covers over every single thing you do. He does. It's because of the work of the Holy Spirit that you have hope. It's because of the work of the Holy Spirit that we can share hope with the world. That's what, that's what God wants. That's, that's what he wants us to be preaching in Christ. In Christ, there is no more shame. There is no more guilt. There is no more condemnation. That's been broken. Oh, the world has fallen apart. Yeah. It's full of disease and sickness and pestilence and famines and swords and wars. Just like God said was going to happen. But he said he brought his kingdom to us because he fixed the spiritual kingdom. He fixed the spiritual kingdom. And yet we still act like somehow or another we think he's still going to fix the physical kingdom. All of our prayers are built around, fix the physical kingdom, God. How do you not care? He's like, I didn't come for that right now. I came to fix the spiritual kingdom. I came to align your mind with my mind through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we are ambassadors. We are ambassadors of that great message. But too often times, I feel like we forget the fundamentals of how great that is. So the question is, are you an ambassador of that? 
Is your, is, is, are you taking the message of Christ out there? You see, at Growth Track, we'll go back to Growth Track. All right, what we teach in Growth Track is this. Your personality, okay, we have a tool that we use to help you understand your personality, your unique makeup in this life. Uh, we particularly use the tool of the Enneagram. All right, your personality combined with your giftedness, we use spiritual gift tests. We find what your spiritual gift is equips you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, which can be a reflection of his glory, all right? So that is what growth track is all about. Your personality combined with your giftedness equips you to lead others to his glory, plain and simple. Do you see how all these DNA pieces guide every single decision we make at Journey? It's, it's woven through the fabric of who we are. All right, let me do one more for you, give you another example. Uh, I don't know if you guys can remember a vision statement, but it says this. Mission statement, excuse me. We are transformed people. That's the glory of God. We are the transformed people, changing our friends' lives. Oh, doggone it, there's that. Everybody's a missionary. Through the absolute hope. And this one is the third statement that we'll give you. A church is less than the church. That's why we talk about the absolute hope. We live in a world that thinks that everything is relative, and I'm just here to tell you it's not. The hope of Jesus Christ is the only thing that is absolute in this world. And the church, the big C church, should be a reflection of that hope. But unfortunately, oftentimes, we try and find a local church that is a reflection of what we value and what we hold dear. All right? So a church is less than the church. The church should be all about sharing the hope of Jesus Christ with a world that is lost. And we get our focus misaligned at times. So that's the last thing I want to share with you this morning on, on this idea of the movement. So the movement of God is made up of his glory. It's made up of every missionary being a believer. And then it's made up of this statement right here. A church is less than the church. A church is less than the church. Say it with me. A church is less than the church. So that means journey is less than the church, which is why we don't, we don't say that we're all that. It's not even one of our values. Look at what Jesus says in the book of John. I have given them the glory that you gave me. Jesus himself says, he has given you his glory. This, isn't, this is the individuals that make up his church. I have given them the glory that God the Father had given to him, that they may be one as we are one. Oh boy. Keep going. I am in them and you are in me. May they be made completely one so that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Wow. You see, what Christ was telling us is that the church should be all about the glory of God, his Father. The church should be a direct reflection of the glory of God. You and I should be a direct reflection of the glory of God. We are in dangerous times right now, my friends living in America as it is. And some of you are not going to like what I'm going to say next. But I want to challenge each and every single one of you right now to make a very distinct difference between your faith and your politics. A patriotic, the more patriotic you are, all right, simply makes you more patriotic, not more godly. Hear, let, hear me on that, please. The more patriotic you are, simply makes you more patriotic. It does not make you more godly. Okay? And that is a difficult tension that every single one of us are living in right now in the United States of America. It is a difficult tension that we are living in in the church right now. And I have pastor friends all over the country. Some are using the, the pulpit as a whip. Some are using it as a podium for a political rally. And that's fine if they will call it that. But too often times what we do in the name of Jesus is we spiritualize our politics. And then we begin to hate and demonize anybody that stands in the way of our opinions. Because clearly they cannot have a relationship with God like I have with God. Because if they really knew God the way I understood God, they would be more socially justice driven. No, no. If they really understood God and what I know about God, they would understand that his sacrifice on the cross is the greatest symbol of freedom ever given to mankind. And freedom is what our Constitution stands for. Folks, I could go on and on. But patriotism does not mean godliness. 
And we have to be very careful with that. I am not going to tell you don't be patriotic. I would be a hypocrite if I told you that. I am as red-blooded patriot as you could possibly get. I will fight for you and I will die for you. I don't even care if you dislike me. I will fight for your freedoms. But I'm going to tell you that is my constitutional patriotic duty as a citizen. It is not my God-given right. It boils my blood when I hear and see Christians post, it is my God-given right to blah, 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 whatever. You fill in the blank on your politics. I'm here to tell you, it is your God-given right to die a damned death in hell for eternity. That's your God-given right, separated from God in the Garden of Eden. So take that and put that in your politics. Don't claim your constitutional rights are your God-given right. Your God-given right is to die eternally separated from Him. That's your God-given right. Now, your politically constitutional right, it's called the Constitution. Understand it. Fight for it. Stand up for it. But please, don't make the American Constitution your Bible. All right? If we are really about preaching the gospel, if we're really about glorifying God, then the message that I preach on this stage has to be able to be preached to my brothers and sisters in Haiti. Has to be able to be preached to my brothers and sisters in Afghanistan who are currently having their heads chopped off. Has to be able to be preached to my brothers and sisters in Kenya, in China. And I have brothers and sisters all across the world. So I can't use the podium to be my political pedestal. Now trust me, I have a whole lot of personal opinions. So I live in a very strong, tense world. I do. But the podiums, the pulpit's not the place to divide the church. We just read Jesus wants us to be one. And pastors, we're the ones that are making it worse half the time. So we've got to understand the tension. You see, live out your political rights. Live out your constitutional rights. I, I, I trust me. I get it. <laughs> Believe me, I get it. I feel your tensions. Some of you, some of you hate me, all right? It's okay. It really is. Like, I, you might not believe this, but I have friends that think I have sold my soul to the left liberal group. They think I'm the biggest liberal that won't stand up for what I believe in. And then I have other friends that think I'm a right-wing extremist, and they've canceled me because I'm no longer their friend anymore. Folks, I can't be both. It's impossible. But what I do hope is it simply symbolizes the fact that I'm trying to live somewhere in the middle. I'm trying to hold my patriotic values, my constitutional rights, in balance with my love of God and humans. And man, they combat each other sometimes. But that's your challenge. We're living in a world right now which is full of darkness and doom and despair. You have opportunity to bring glory to God in just about every conversation you can get in. Whether we're talking about politics and government control, or we're talking about dying of COVID, you have an opportunity to point people to the hope of Jesus Christ. We're no different than the disciples were back in Jesus' time. I, wanted, I just want you to see how easy it is for us to get so politically dogmatic because Jesus' disciples did the same thing. This is the, the passage I'm going to give you is right after Jesus rose from the dead. It's in chapter, Acts chapter 1. And he rose from the dead and he meets with 500 of his disciples, closest followers, all right? And they had some questions. This is before he, wrote, before he went to heaven. So he's talking to them. This is what they ask him. I just think this is phenomenal. So when they had come together, they asked him, wouldn't you have loved to be able to be there with Jesus and just ask him a question after you saw him rise? You just saw him literally uh, be beaten with a cat of nine tails. His skin was hanging like ribbons from his body, blood everywhere, thorn <laughs> shoved onto his head with a whip. And a, I mean, okay, you guys don't read the Bible like that? Okay, but that's, that's really what happened. And so they got to see Jesus after he rose from the dead. And they had a couple questions. Look where they went. So God, you going to restore the kingdom of Israel this time? So God, now are you going to be the Messiah? So Jesus, now are you going to restore Israel to its rightful place? So God, now are you going to get involved in politics? 
So God, now are you going to become our king? Look at what Jesus says. It's not for you to know the times or the periods that the Father has set by his own authority. See how quickly we shift our focus? It's because of our humanity. Keep going. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Because he wanted us to take our message of hope into free countries and to persecuted countries. And the message of hope is the same regardless of where you go. What happens to you is going to be dictated by the citizenship that you carry. So there is importance in that, but not to Christ. He wants you to go back to being that every believer is a missionary everywhere we go. They wanted him to restore the power that the Messiah was supposed to bring. And that seems to be our problem right now, too. We just want God to restore and redeem America back to its greatness once again. Folks, we are America. We are the church. We are a reflection of God's glory. Get involved and do things, but remember, you're taking the message of hope into every conversation that you're going through. How are you reflecting God's glory in that moment? I'm not saying you're going to agree with everybody. Please don't hear me say that. I'm saying love everybody when you disagree with them. Treat everybody with honor, dignity, and respect and the love of Christ when you disagree with them. Just remember, you're a missionary. You're a missionary right now where you live, learn, work, and play. The question you have to ask yourself is what message of hope are you declaring to your circles? What message of hope are you declaring? See, Christ brought his kingdom to the earth. And next week, Matt's going to be talking about what does that kingdom look like in our lives? What kind of a kingdom are we living in down here? You're going to hear about that next week. He gave us, Jesus gave us the keys to his kingdom. Jesus even said, you're going to do greater things than I even did. Wow. So I want to end, I want to end on a passage uh, that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. All right. Now, I've adapted this. All right. This is not how the Bible reads. It reads very close. I've just changed a few words because I want it to sound like Paul is making his appeal to the American church right now, today, this morning. And folks, I, want, I really need you to understand something here. I wrote all this content and this message on Wednesday before anything happened politically. Okay? God has a sense of humor. He really does. So when I, re- when I read this, this was written on Wednesday, before anything changed, before any hoopla hit the fan. This is how I think Paul would address our church here this morning. So I'm going to read it from that perspective. And actually, you're going to look at it from up there. I'm just going to read it from my notes. My dear brothers and sisters in America, God said, let there be light in the darkness. In fact, he made it possible for this light to shine in your hearts so that all could know the glory of God. That glory that is seen in Jesus Christ. You see, you have the light shining in your heart, but you're like a fragile clay jar containing this incredible great treasure. But that's because it makes it clear that this power is from God and not yourself. Oh, you may feel pressed on each side by troubles, but you're not crushed. You're not crushed this morning. Oh, you may be perplexed, but don't be driven to despair. You may even feel hunted down or cast out of your own family or friend groups. But have hope, you will never be abandoned by God. Oh, you will definitely get knocked down, but you will not be destroyed. Dear church, through this current time of suffering, your bodies, they're going to continue to share in the death of Jesus. Oh, yeah. And the reason why is so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in your life and the reflection of his hope. 
Because hope is best expressed in the midst of suffering, people. So even though you don't live in the constant danger of death, like your brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, because you serve Jesus, live so that the life of Jesus will be reflected in all you do, even if your body is dying, dying of COVID. Please live life to the fullest, even in the face of COVID, so that others can see his eternal life reflected in you. Please continue to share with your friends the message of absolute hope, because you have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believe God, and I spoke. You know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us, all of us, with Jesus and to present us to himself together with the whole church, the big C church. And all this is for your benefit. Because as God's grace reaches more and more people through you, as you become this messenger, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more glory. That is why you should never give up. Yes, yes, yes. Your, your bodies are dying. But your spirit should be renewed every day. Your present troubles, oh, they're small. They're small. They aren't going to last very long. So please be aware that they produce an opportunity for you for a glory that vastly outweighs the trouble that you're in. And that glory... Oh, it will last forever. So don't keep looking at your troubles. Rather, fix your gaze on the things that can't be seen. The troubles and the heartache that you now see, oh, they're going to soon be gone. But the things you can't see, it's going to last forever. It's going to last forever. And I can't end it any better than the way I think Paul would address our church. Let's pray. Dear God, we, uh, we come before you, and Lord, we do. We live in a tense world right now, a world that is divided. Lord, we live in a church that's divided right now. God, we don't always do a very good job of being one like you asked us to. So God, forgive us. Forgive us for making this world about ourselves. God, help us to know how to declare that tension. Help us to know how to stand upon our, our citizenship rights, regardless of country, while holding in balance the purpose you put us here. Oh God, let us hold that tension with great, delicate hands, like that fragile clay jar. Forgive us when we make it a mess. Give us your wisdom. Help us to know what to do, but God, help your love to be evident to all those whom we talk with. Lord, in the face of our sicknesses and our disease and the fears that we have, God, may we sense your, may we sense your power and your hope. May we bring hope to those who are suffering and sick. May we always remember that you have never let go. God, we love you. Jesus, we thank you. Spirit, we ask you to guide us into all truth. Thank you, God, for this incredible opportunity to be a part of your church. Amen.